information forms that are in your packets. We'd like to make sure that you fill those out and turn them in. Some have asked about their certificates. If you want a printed certificate for CEU, you can do that after the conference online by going on the website. Your name will be loaded in and you can print out your certificate at any time for the conference. And if you have any questions, just talk with uh, the CE people out there at the registration desk or one of us and we'll try to help you with it. Sun Plus, if you'll stand up. Uh, Josh and his folks are here from Sun Plus. They're gonna be making some presentations uh, tomorrow. Um, and uh, they'll be uh, dealing with some of the issues that uh, with the Sun Plus system and answer any questions that you may have. We want to remind you that they're going to be, I think, all afternoon tomorrow from 1 to 5 with a session. They'll be fairly intense and then in the morning they'll be making probably some comments to everybody uh, during the AHI session. Tomorrow morning at, at 8 in this room we're going to have uh, an, a whole morning of AHI meetings, if you will. Uh, D.P. Harris is going to start talking with Jerry Crispins and some others about some of the challenges we have with connecting. And then we're going to go into a, a general session of that will involve the AHI folks uh, to talk about some of the things that, that we do in relating to those institutions. So if you're from an AHI hospital, uh, you'll be here uh, tomorrow morning uh, dealing with those things with us. Uh, we're putting out a list of all of the people who have attended the conference with name, institution, and email address. If you don't want to be on that list, let us know by noon today and we won't put you on it. We hope you will be on it. But we'd like, we've had a lot of people that have networked and connected here and you know, we want to give people the opportunity to opt out of that list. But if you, if you would like, we're going to distribute that to every participant so that the networking that is, has happened over the last few days can continue after you go home. And so we'll put that out to everyone. And finally, we would like to take a group photo. And we're trying to get that scheduled, we think, probably right before the banquet tonight. Uh, that would be a good time. Uh, we have some challenges. We understand some people have bought maybe some special dresses or clothing to wear for the banquet since it's a cultural banquet. We haven't quite figured out how to uh, get everybody back to the hotels and get back here, but uh, we'll, uh, maybe you can let us know and we can run a van or two over for some of the ladies in particular that have brought special things. We want to try to honor you with that and meet your needs. So, but stay tuned for a group photo tonight probably right before the banquet, and uh, it'll be probably outside here if the weather's permitting and everything's looking good at that time, uh, right before we go and get started. I think that's about all that we've got for announcements. Dr. Hart, if you want to maybe perhaps make some comments. Well, good to see all of you up and going and functioning this morning. Uh, the conference officially will end this evening, uh, but we have chosen to, for those of you who want to stay on, there's a couple things happening. To, most of tomorrow we're going to have dealing with various AHI-related issues, everything from website issues to policy issues to accounting issues to whatever. Uh, and if uh, some of you are here and want to attend that that are not part of an AHI hospital, that's fine. It's an open session we'll be meeting here, but fine to just go through some of the logistics that we're dealing with in that. Um, some of you, I think also there'll be some clinical tours or rotation. Yeah, tour, I think at 920. So some of you wanted to see some of the clinical facilities and that's a possible tomorrow as well if you wanted to, to spend some time with that uh, and uh, see some of the different parts of Loma Linda that we haven't uh, gotten to. Problem with not putting on your glasses and reading your notes. Uh, Walt Johnson has reminded us about the WHO forms. How many people have actually filled it out? Okay, they get stars. Please, if you need a form, we'd like to get this information to get registered into the database so we have data on our, our hospitals. The way it really helps us is when we go to apply for a grant, this gives us reliable information to tell who we are and what we do. 
So it's really important that we do this. Sometimes we operate so insulated from the rest of the world. This is valuable to us. We, we've got some opportunities with USAID and other or organizations to perhaps get some funding. And this is where it starts. So we really need you to fill this out. If you've lost your copy, see us. It's on the WHO website. We would really like to try to participate in this uh, data collection so that all the good work that we're doing around the world uh, gets noticed and recognized. Thank you. And this is why there's such incredible value in being systems, because once you start gluing a few places together, you get a lot more credibility than if you're just an individual hospital by itself. Many times I get asked, because I come out of a public health background, of, you know, are hospitals really that important, and what about the community? And I've always, my answer for years has been, communities are probably the most important, but it's hard to get to the community if the institution is failing. And so we believe it's important to work on both the institution as well as the community. And as institutions get stronger, get more robust, then there's more interest and ability to start getting out and doing community programs. So we're delighted this morning to put the, some emphasis on the whole community aspect of international health care, which I view as an absolutely critical part and probably the most cost-effective thing that we can do is working in the communities. We've asked Dr. Tricia Pennycook uh, to lead in this discussion. Uh, Dr. Pennycook is originally from Costa Rica uh, and uh, was trained at Montemorelos in both medicine and public health, came up here and joined our faculty uh, a few years ago as the academic dean of the School of Public Health, and then two years ago uh, became dean of the School of Public Health here at Loma Linda. So she's uniquely equipped with a background to address this, has worked in the public sector in Costa Rica in the past, uh, and we're delighted to have her here with us to be able to share the whole perspective, which I see is really the, the next logical step of strengthening the institution is then start reaching out and serving the community. So, Trish. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. technology. We came in, Ted and I came in extra early just to make sure it worked. And my youngest brother and I worked on the presentation and I said I need a couple backup plans. I need it on a laptop, I need it on a flash drive just in case internet doesn't work. And when I came, I didn't have the adapter for the laptop. The flash drive didn't work, so hopefully internet will. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for this morning and for this wonderful opportunity to connect with each other and talk about your vision for Mission Hospitals and Public Health. We ask you to be with us and to bless us. Bless our families, wherever they may be as well, and those who travel, take care of them too. In your name we pray, amen. My favorite word in the Bible is hesed. It's a word that is translated in many different ways, loving kindness, just love, long-suffering, and what it means is when somebody does something for you that only that person can do, and what they do saves your life. So it's like what God has done for us. What He did for us, only He can do, and what He has done has saved our lives. And the best way to see it is through stories in the Bible. There's many different stories that have hesed in them, and you probably Remember most of them. We have Ruth. When Boaz and Ruth finally met and talked a long conversation, he said, you have shown hesed to me and to your mother-in-law. You've done something for me because you chose me and I'm an old man when you could have chosen younger men. He thought Ruth was the only one who could do that for him. There's another story that has hesed and that's Joseph's story. And it's an interesting part of it because it's when Joseph interprets the dream of the cupbearer and the baker, remember? And the cupbearer is happy and the baker is not so happy. And in the middle of the cupbearer's happiness, Joseph says, please remember me and have pity on me. And that word pity that he uses is hesed. 
He was saying, please do something for me that only you can do for me. Speak to the Pharaoh and tell him I shouldn't be here. When I was thinking about our conversation this morning, I thought about Hesed and what Dr. Hart mentioned Thursday evening. What is it that mission hospitals and clinics can do that no one else can do and that will save people's lives? And if there's one thing that I would like you to think about as we go through our conversation today, it's precisely that in your setting, whether it's at the world church level, at the local church, in the community, in an academic institution, or in a mission hospital or clinic, what is it that you can do and your institution can do to save someone's life that no one else can do? Which means if we don't do it, no one else is doing it and people will die. So um, I, I <coughs> called it a sermon in shoes. I'm sure some of you remember that little song from Sabbath school, a sermon in shoes. The role of public health in mission hospitals. And after I had sent in the outline and thought about our conversation a little more, I said maybe it's flipped around and it should be the role of mission hospitals in public health. But we'll work through that today. <coughs> so since you're gonna grade me on my objectives, we're gonna go through them. The first one is to understand the role of mission hospitals in the development of healthcare service provision in the context of public health history Second one, describe the challenges that mission hospitals face in the current environment in developing countries. Third and most important, discuss a new paradigm of operation for mission hospitals that is based on public health indicators and principles and is relevant to their religious legacy. All of this, I believe, is in your handbook. The overview is there as well. So we know that mission hospitals have provided health care for many years to underserved populations, but things are changing. Things are changing everywhere, not just in the world, but in the local field. It's not the way it used to be, where um, someone had to come from abroad to provide health care to the people. Now the people can provide their own health care. And as that changes, how does the church need to change, how does academic <coughs> academia need to change, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And the most important thing here then is if other people are doing it and they're doing it well, what makes us special? And that that makes us special we need to do really well. Everybody likes stories, and stories are as much about the content as the storyteller, right? You can have a really nice story and somebody very boring telling it, and it dies. And you can have someone that's very enthusiastic and energetic with nothing to say, right? So what I've tried to do today is in between the points we're going to make, hear the voices of people who actually live the stories. Because it's nothing is the same as when you're telling your own story. So I've asked people who have been in mission hospitals in the field, or still are, to tell me their perspectives on this. I've asked some of our students in the School of Public Health who've had experience in it to write what their perspective is on it. And I have some clips of one particular story and when you see his name, you'll know why I feel free to use it, because I know him pretty well. And it'll be an effort to try to think about how we can marry medicine and public health in the clinic or local hospital. Medicine and public health don't always play well in the sandbox. And this is one way of looking at how we can work better as partners. So let's begin. So I'm going to go quickly through the outline. Mm -hmm. 
And we're going to go through these points today. You have them also in the handout. So first part, healthcare in the scope of our philosophical legacy. The reason why we do healthcare in this church is because of what? And this is a conversation, not a sermon, so feel free to jump in anytime. Because we want to make money? Is that it? Why? We want fame and fortune? We want to be known for having mission hospitals? Why do we do this? I know some names. I can call on people. <laughs> we have a mandate, right? We have a mandate that says heal the sick, raise the dead. He's asking us to raise the dead, cure those with leprosy and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. It's a mandate. There's another one. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. And the disciples went everywhere and preached and the Lord worked through them confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. So the reason we do this, our philosophical foundation, is a mandate from God that says go out and heal people and do it everywhere and try to heal everyone. It's not a step to something else. And that is something that I'd like us to think about a little today. It's not heal as a step to get somewhere else. It's not a bridge. It's not just a door. The end itself is healing. Heal the sick. Okay. So, the first part of the story. We all have seen this quote, Christ method. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. And this is the route that not only the Adventist church, but churches in general took towards the missions. They started by trying to get close to people, learning their language, filling their needs, and then hopefully telling them, follow me. That didn't work initially too well because people were suspicious. Sometimes we go in with the idea of saying the follow me from the very beginning and people know that we're after something else. So that's why it's important for us to always keep in mind that healing itself Health itself is the end. It's not just a means to an end. Patients that come to Maluti, you end up receiving these patients in that have an anxiety and of if, if someone touches my eye, if that person that's at that hospital does something for us, then if it's God's will, we'll be able to get back to our normal lives, quote unquote. Volume? Okay, thanks. That was my brother. I have two younger brothers. And he is an eye surgeon in Lesotho. Um, he grew up singing missionary songs and found a girlfriend who grew up singing mission field songs. And they were K-I-S-S-I-N-G in a tree. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and they're in Lesotho now. They were in Zambia before. They've been almost 10 years out in the mission field. And I'm going to show little clips of the conversation with him because surgery and public health are almost in opposite ends. Doesn't it seem like that sometimes? And really, it's not that way at all. Surgeons might be surprised to find out that they are part of public health. And public health needs to realize that it needs to see what's happening in the field and bring it to the classroom <coughs> so that we serve people where they are with the needs they have. So 
So a brief history of missionary medicine's role in the healthcare services. And here we're not going to talk about just our church, but in general. As we said, it's a mandate from the birth of Christianity, but there was a confusion between care for the sick versus healing. What were we supposed to do? Initially, after Jesus left and the miracle stopped, the Christian church was associated with caring for the sick. They took care of people who no one else wanted to take care of. That's how these things started. And there were reasons why healing was not considered number one. Remember the first verse we saw that said, what give freely? Give freely. Freely you have received, freely give. So they didn't think that they had the option of charging people money for health care. They couldn't make a living out of it. Secondly, in those times, healing was not a scientific enterprise. And the church did not want to associate itself with practices that seemed ludicrous. So they limited themselves to just taking care of the sick. No healing. Religious missions from Europe and America established rural hospitals that were sometimes integrated into national hospital systems. So this is how the progression happened. In many places, the only hospitals they had or clinics were mission hospitals. And once their health systems became more solid, they incorporated those mission hospitals into their systems. Dr. Hart mentioned it Thursday night as well. Many denominations were happy to let them go. For reasons that we all know, we weren't very happy and we haven't let them go. There's got to be a reason why that is. So this is a map that shows where our hospitals and clinics are. They're not all there, because as we'll see, we'll see soon, there's many. But this gives us a general idea. What do you see? Where, where are we not? Are you happy with this map? As I said, they're not all there. There's 173, and this is 2010 data. It's probably some differences. Some new ones have opened, some have closed down. Nursing homes and retirement centers, clinics and dispensaries, outpatient visits. What do you think? Are you happy with those numbers? It's better than anything else we do. I like that. I'm happy. Since I control a microphone. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> you know, probably the most disturbing thing about this to, to mm -hmm. me is that that's basically the same numbers that were there 60 years ago. Okay. There's been no real new development mm -hmm. other than in the U.S. in the last 60 years. Okay. Okay. Let's stop there a little bit then. Do we need more? Do we need better? Do we need different? Or we need all of the above? How many think all of the above? Okay. So where does the money come from to do more better? <laughs> and different. That's the challenge, right? It's not just opening it, but then sustaining it, making it better. And over the years, the hospital has run at 
high occupation levels. The eye uh, services have a lot to do with this because when the hospital started, there were no specialized eye services at all. And Maluti is well known throughout the country for the eye services. People come from all over. I don't know how to do it, I asked it. It's a major role that we play here. Um, yeah. So we can hear it. I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so while Ted helps us a little bit with the volume, the reason this clip is there is it represents what mission hospitals mean in the countries and communities where they are. Yeah? Okay. and population is close to two million. So it gives us a lot of work around in the area. Let me start it over. And over the years, the hospital has run at high occupation levels. The eye services have a lot to do with this because when the hospital started, there were no specialized eye services at all and Maluti is well known throughout the country for the eye services. People come from all over. It's a major role that we play here um, and there's only three other eye doctors in the country. Um, it's the country and population is close to two million. So it gives us a lot of work around in the area. Um, I work here as the ophthalmologist, as the eye surgeon, uh, but I obviously see a lot of patients as well do the clinics in the area around. Three hospitals, three eye surgeons for a country of a million people. Now there's two, okay. And it was the first one there. So what our mission hospitals and clinics have ser served as is providing health care to people who have no access. Still, sometimes we think that was a long time ago. Still, access doesn't mean only that you can get there on foot or by train or car or cart or whatever. It also means language. It means culture. If all you have in your hospital are male physicians, and in that culture they're not allowed to see women, there's no access. And what public health is supposed to do is to be the bridge stand in the gap, like the Bible says. So make sure that everyone has the opportunity to access to health care. It's not just standing in front of a group and giving speeches about how to live a better life. It's supposed to guarantee health care as well. So the role of Mission Hospitals in Public Health starts with that providing access to people to the health care they need. Oscar and Maria Eugenia Giordano are in South Africa. They're from Argentina, and they started working with AIDS patients there a while ago. They have come, they come here every year. They came to the school <coughs> last year. And when we asked them what the traditional role, this is what they said. When we think of missionary hospitals, we imagine places that are isolated from big cities and have limited resources. One of the greatest contributions of missionary hospitals to public health has been to take health care to those people 
who had no access to care and lacked basic health knowledge. We must not forget that the role of our medical institutions has included preventive medicine and education, not just health care. A great number of people have learned basic medical notions, the eight natural remedies, and healthy nutrition from these institutions. Biblical counsel, the writings of Ellen G. White, one of Loma Linda's founders, and scientific knowledge have been used in Adventist mission hospitals to develop courses and seminars that have significant contributions to the public's health around the world. Boaz is one of our alumni and he's in Senegal. The biggest challenge that I have seen is that a greater emphasis is placed on clinical work and not enough of public health. As the doctors built institutions from small tables under mango trees, there has been a greater emphasis on building up the clinical aspects of healthcare and acquiring more clinical machinery to support the medical needs of the local population. Does this sound expensive to you? It, it is expensive. And it's not just the buying the initial equipment, but actually keeping it up. Do we have a lot of money floating around our hospitals and clinics? I have apartments. Um, That's expensive equipment right there. It was pretty much established in, at the beginning of the hospital. Uh, in the late 50s, early 60s. The idea has always been to be able to help the majority of the poor people that are around with the best equipment possible in the area. And that has been the traditional role of hospitals and clinics in the mission field. is taking the health care and, as Dr. Hart mentioned again on Thursday night, being the best one. They told the expats, if you get sick, you need to get to the Adventist hospital or clinic. That's where they have the best doctors. That's where they have the equipment. Is that the way that we can continue to survive? Is that sustainable? Can we still do that? Are we still doing it? Help me out here, please. I had a teacher who used to say, I feel like John the Baptist, a voice crying out in the desert. <laughs> Are we still doing that? Sorry? Not in a lot of places. Can we still do it? Hmm? It depends on where we go. So maybe it's time for a paradigm shift. Un cambio de paradigma. Public health has 10 essential services, and we're going to go really quickly through this, just to lay a basic foundation for those of us who haven't been really acquainted with what public health is. It has three core functions, assessment, policy development, and assurance. And believe it or not, this is not just a federal function. It's not just a government function. Every institution that provides health care does these as well, or should be doing those as well. It should be evaluating. It has policies that are developed on purpose or not, and it needs to give assurance of care. So those are the three basic functions, and they're divided into essential services. Before that, the vision of public health is healthy people in healthy communities, and mission promote physical and mental health and prevent. So it's promoting health and preventing injury and disease. And these are some of the things that public health does. And we, I think we're all acquainted with them. The prevention of epidemics, the protection against environmental hazards, injuries, promoting and encouraging healthy behaviors, responding to disasters, 
assuring quality and accessibility of health services. And these are the 10 essential services, and we're gonna go through them one by one. They are divided in between the three core functions we talked about. So the first ones are part of assessment to monitor health and diagnose and investigate. Then we have the inform, educate, and empower communities, mobilizing the partnerships, developing policies and enforcing laws that are policy development, and this is in the area of the community specifically. Then we have assurance. We link people to their health care. We assure there's a competent workforce, and we evaluate. And last but not least, at the center of everything is research. Research informs what we do, what we do gives us ideas of new venues to look to discover, okay? I would like us to start thinking about how mission hospitals and clinics do these. Do you think they do these? Some, some of those or some do them or both, okay. So monitor, what's going on? How does the hospital or the clinic know what's going on in the community? How do you find out? If there's an outbreak, somebody served old potato salad at a church picnic, potluck. How does the clinic or hospital find out? Sick people show up. It's the only way. Sometimes we find out with the news. Sometimes our own people don't show up because they ate the potato salad. Do you think it would be wise for our hospitals and clinics to have a system of finding out what's going on in the community in order to prepare? Would that be wise? That's public health. Isn't this something the government should do? Shouldn't the government call the hospital and say, hey, you've got an outbreak, somebody served potato salad, prepare? The government usually finds out with the news. I know I work there. <laughs> I used to, I worked there. Okay, diagnose. Identify and respond to health problems or threats. If we don't know, how can we prepare and respond? And when it's time to spend money, how does most of the money get spent unexpectedly? What happens? Is it something that we were planning for? It's usually what? A disaster, an emergency, something that overwhelms our capacity, and the little we had put up for something that was long-term, maybe a new building, maybe a public health program, has to be diverted Okay, keep people informed about health issues and healthy choices. How does the Mission Hospital do this? How do you inform people of healthy choices? One by one? Education, how? Specific. You stand up in front of a, the patients in the waiting room and so when they're there as a captive audience, you give them the speech. Churches, so you go out of the hospital. Yeah? Hmm? In the community. How in the community? I heard radio and television, is that what I heard? Okay. I want you to think a little bit outside your box. We're gonna talk a little bit about that, a little bit more. 
Let's keep going. Engage people and organizations in health issues. How do we engage the community from the mission, hospital, or clinic? How does that engagement happen? Come on, guys. How do we get them involved? <coughs> Health fairs? Have them lead out? Sorry? Put the leaders on the advisory committees. I want you to notice a shift in thinking here. Okay? A shifting thinking here. The community is not just good for us to serve but they're good enough to help lead and direct. It's their community. So if we're running our mission hospital and clinic and they're not involved, not just as informants, but as participants and helping to make the decisions, we're not engaging the community. It's a different relationship. Plan and implement sound health policies. Do mission hospitals and clinics implement policies, plan policies? Yes? An example. Of how a mission hospital or clinic develops and implements a policy that affects the community's health. A real one, a real example. Every pregnant woman that comes in should be checked for HIV. Does that sound like a policy? That's a policy. Is that something that the government is asking the hospital to do? In some places. But if the hospital or clinic knows its community, is engaged with them and knows the problems that exist there, that can help inform the way they work so they can develop the policies. Same thing with children under five years old, for example. Every, if every pregnant woman that comes in with a child, if she comes in, we check the child as well. That's a policy. She may not have come for that, but that's a policy. We decide to develop and implement because we know there's malnourishment in our communities and that's how we'll get them. Or the other way around. It's, it's usually not the child who doesn't have the care, it's the mother, right? She takes care of everybody else and not herself. So when she brings the child in, our policy can be check her. Okay. Enforce public health laws and regulations. This one, nobody really likes because it's usually paperwork. especially doctors. I can say it because I used to not do it either. <laughs> <laughs> you see something come in and if you put a certain name on it, then it's going to trigger a whole cascade of stuff that's going to take up your time. So the easiest thing is not to call it what it is and call it something else. That's not enforcing public health laws. The government should know that as soon as someone hits the door of a mission hospital, if it's something that needs to be reported, it's going to be reported because we do our job honestly. Okay? Make sure people receive the medical care they need. This one we do well. I think this one we do well. When they come, we try to do our best to care for them. When they come. When they come. <laughs> when they come. We try to do our best for them. <coughs> Maintain a competent public health and medical workforce. 
Do you believe that we have the people we need in our hospitals and clinics as far as diversity in their training? What do you believe? Yes or no? How many say yes? Wow, not a okay one. How many say no? So all of you who didn't raise your hand say nothing? So what's the answer here? Do we get more people? Do we train the ones we have better if they're good? Do we have the resources to get a, someone of everything? So where should that happen? Where should that training happen? When they get to our hospital and clinic? In school maybe? No? Not in school? En el hospital. Okay. Porque la escuela no sabe lo que está pasando. Because the school doesn't know what's going on? Maybe? Okay. Maybe it's Sunday morning and everyone's really quiet today. Maybe that's it. Evaluate and improve programs. When do we get to evaluate? Ourselves. Because that's different than having people come and evaluate us. That happens a lot, all the time. Do we have time to evaluate ourselves and our programs? How does a program improve? How would we know what needs to be improved if we're not evaluating? Okay? Support innovation and identify and use best practices. How often do we have a chance to do what we're doing here and connect and say, I have this problem, you have the same problem, how did you deal with it? How can I deal with it? And sometimes there's people who have really cool ideas that we hadn't thought about, and this is an opportunity to share those. How many of us have access to internet and databases and the new literature to kind of brush up? I think we have a breakout session today around library resources. Who has the time? You see the 10 essential services of public health and how they all can actually be implemented in a mission, hospital and clinic. And a lot of this we already do. Okay. So we've gone through these, I'll skip to them. Time is our enemy and our friend if you don't want to be here forever. Dr. Mataya is one of our faculty and when I asked him the question, the question, there were two questions. One was, what has been the traditional role of mission hospitals and clinics? Second question was, looking at current trends, what should that role be? So this was his answer. They have done well in the provision of facility-based health care services since many of them, especially in Africa, are located in rural areas where there are no other facilities. We have not done well reaching out to the communities around our facilities because physicians and other cadre of health workers are too busy caring for very ill patients both in the out and inpatient services. I personally found this very challenging as I worked in Malawi. Patients came to us and we did not go to them to find out why they were ill. I think we should put more emphasis on preventive and community health. Every mission hospital should have a community health department with clinical and public health professionals who go out to the communities to conduct community assessments and help the communities to implement interventions that will benefit them where they are, saving them having to go to the hospital. Does this make sense to you here? Does it make sense here? 
Okay, so there's got to be a way, right? Because if it makes sense here, there has to be a way to also make sense here. If not, that's not fair, right? Now, why do you think that the hospitals and clinics get very ill patients? Why is that? Why don't they come? The answer was they don't come early enough. Why don't they come early enough? They can't pay? Is that the only reason? Sorry? They're scared? They think they can do it themselves. They try their home remedies first and go down the line and as the final resource they get to the hospital? It will go away. If I ignore it, it'll go away. At the end of the day, is this saving the hospital money? What would happen if some of that money was spent finding the patients before they became very ill? Because one of the reasons we said is, right, they don't have the money to come. Do we end up seeing patients who don't have money anyway? Everywhere, right? And usually they're in such a state that you can't turn them out. And it's very expensive care, right? So wouldn't it be, make some sense to find them before they got to that stage? Where would we find them? In the community, so they go to the plaza in the center of the community, and we go there and there they are. I know I'm being ridiculous, but I want us to be very specific at home. How do we get to their homes? How do we get to their homes? On their cell phones. Uh, well, I studied medicine and public health in Montemorelos, Mexico. I started studying in 1987. I know I don't look that old, but hey. Um, and it was very, my love for public health started there. When we went out to see the patients and I saw on one side of the street a house that covers a whole block with a huge wall all around. You know there's a house in there, but you can't see anything. And right across the street, there's people drinking from wells. The same, I can see the, the street, and it's really close to our university. Okay? In our year of social service, that's a year you give to the government for free. Right, DJ? There were houses where there were dirt floors, no refrigerators, but there was a huge satellite dish. Okay? So, how do you get to the community? You walk? And now we're looking at communities on one end of the spectrum. There's a whole other end we're not really talking about because we're focusing on developing countries. But even in developing countries, there's a whole other end of community that we aren't talking about. How do we get to them and their homes? When I think of what should be, um, I can only think about four things right now. And I think, you can um, hear her, can you? It should. Um, you can? involve working with communities to assist the needs of the communities and to involve the community perspectives and what the community thinks their health care need is. I think another role would be um, to continue for those that have been doing it um, to train health care workers, health care <coughs> professionals to be resources for both the hospitals but to also um, train um, health workers for, for the for government hospitals because they're 
half the time more under-resourced than the medical hospitals. A third one that is key would be to work with local communities, involve local leaders in um, thinking through resources. In very few places, you do not have local leaders that actually, for instance, know what a budget for the mission hospital is. And I think for sustainability, they need to be part of those conversations. There's also the need to not work in isolation, but um, work with local communities, local hospitals, and work on projects together for example, um, mobilizing local resources, training health professionals. So they need to integrate themselves within the communities of the people that they serve and within the existing healthcare systems is key for continued sustainability. That's what I, I Pamela mentioned the word a lot. Who caught it? It starts with an S. <laughs> Sustainability. She she re she repeated that word over and over. The author of this quote is sitting right here, and I asked him because he went to Haiti as part of his medical training, sorta of, right. And I asked him the same question. And he says that it seems that mission hospitals in the past were the experts for public health within their communities. It seems that they needed to rely strongly on public health both to enter the communities and as a way to do prevention. As time has gone on, mission hospitals have become more focused on clinical care and have forgotten the importance of public health, both because acute problems grab your attention so much and because they're easier to acquire funding for. Is this true? It's true. It's not a critical comment on the hospitals, it is true. There are acute problems that need to be dealt with and the few resources we have need to deal with those problems. And it's a lot easier to stand in front of a room full of people that have money and say, if you give me $100,000, I can buy this new, whatchamacallit, and it will save so much money because it would allow me to do this faster, do this more, get more patients. It will allow me to reach another level of patients. That's another thing we do. It will help us to get to the rich patients who will be able to pay for care. Okay, that's a lot easier to get money for. This is a true statement. So then what do we do? So what is a healthy community? It's not just, where, not just where people aren't sick. See what it says? It's continually creating and improving their environment. Why at the community level? Because this is where healing takes place. It's where healing takes place. It's not within the hospital walls. It's actually in the community. And the scale is small enough that modest resources have significant payoff. Why do we need to assess the community? Because in order for us to be relevant in the community, we need to know what the problems are. And we can't do that without it assessment. DJ again. Moving forward, mission hospitals need to return to public health since they often find themselves in communities that have alternative sources for clinical care. And because in the long run, public health provides the most sustainable, long-term health improvements for a community. There is also a need to look at new areas not commonly dealt with in public health based on the problems that they find in their own communities. I know I'm sounding redundant, but it's on purpose. He talks about sustainability here. Not only that, but what happens in the hospital needs to inform public health. And we'll see why that's important in a minute. When we arrived in Adra, Senegal, 
in Senegal. ADRA was doing some projects at the clinic. They trained some community health workers to do health presentations in our village and various surrounding villages. The presentations were well received. Sadly, the programs were only for a short time and now the funding has dried